Hi, I'm, uh, my name is Paul Bradley. I am a chief data scientist with uh, Zermed. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at the third annual Global Big Data Conference. Um, I'm excited today. I'm going to talk to you about um, how healthcare providers can leverage big data to boost their efficiencies and cost savings. And then I'll go into two, um, have two case studies with some of our clients where, uh, to show you some of the results that, that we brought to them. Um, so to, to start off with, um, I want to go over how providers can use their own data that they collect as part of their normal operations. And typically, a lot of the data I'm going to talk to you about is collected by healthcare providers for the purpose of producing a claim for them to send to a payer to get reimbursed. Um, I'll talk about some of the other data elements that providers collect in EHR systems and such forth that can be brought in to help the analytics around some of these industries. Um, and one aspect of the system is automating the process of identifying these uh, accounts where there might be something anomalous going on. So I'll talk about anomalies um, in our analytics that typically relate to um, charges don't get put on a claim that goes to a provider. So an example I'll talk about through this is, let's say, you know, I have, let's say I have a cardiac event that happens, I'm taken to a hospital, and through the course of the treatment, I get a stent is given to me. Um, one to two percent of the time, for a number of different reasons, the code for that stent doesn't get put on the claim that goes to my payer, so the seven to nine thousand dollar charge for that device that went into me doesn't get reimbursed by the, by, the, by the insurance company. So the provider typically eats that in a lot of cases. Um, what we want to do is identify these anomalous accounts so that people can go and verify, verify them, or in this case that I just gave, identify that I actually did get a stent, put that code on, and resubmit the bill to my insurance company. Um, we call that an exception-based workflow. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we'll talk about how this technology has been used with two, two large provider systems around the country. Um, a little bit, I, I won't go too much into my, my background. Um, I had been co-founder of a company uh, called Method Care. Uh, we were out of Chicago, Illinois. We were purchased about a year ago by Zermed. Um, prior to Method Care, I did consulting in the general data mining, data warehousing, predictive analytics field for almost every vertical except healthcare. And then I moved completely into healthcare a couple of years ago. Um, I previously had worked at Microsoft Research, um, had built some of the, the team I worked on, built some of the technology that now ships in SQL Server. And then I did do some consulting work around Microsoft to apply that technology to solve some real business problems that, that they have. So today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Zermed Predictive Analytics, talk to you a little bit more about that charge capture issue, and then uh, go into how we use data models to make predictions to identify these anomalous accounts, um, and then talk to you about these two systems. So we are uh, leaders in healthcare data mining. Those are uh, some of the hospital systems that our clients are represented there on the right. Um, it ranges from large research organizations to large hospital systems around the country. Um, we take uh, the raw material we get from those providers is the data that they collect. And we apply a number of analytics to go through and find these opportunities where they're missing revenue. Um, and then you can think the analytics are prioritizing these opportunities where there's missing revenue. You typically, to recoup missing revenue, it does require a human to intervene. And that's why we've developed these exception-based workflows that keep um, people focused on the right accounts at the right time to get reimbursement. Um, and because we have people working in these work lists and workflows, we're also able to identify the um, their productivity. Are they, are they working um, a sufficient number of accounts a day? Who's doing really well? What, who are people that we need to coach to get them up to speed? Here is an example. Um, we were fortunate enough to win the national case. We were national case study winners in 2012 and 2014. Um, and this was voted on by healthcare people around the um, around the country. And here's an example with one of our clients uh, out in New Mexico, um, Presbyterian Health Systems, which 
they were what's called a pioneering ACO, which was they, they kind of tossed their hat in the ring a few years ago to work, um, work to increase the clinical outcomes of patients um, rather than just be working to do as much as they can to patients. It's part of the Affordable Care Act that came in, that was voted in by Congress a while ago. But Presbyterian has seen a 3% net revenue increase, 150% um, productivity increase with their staff in using, in using these exception-based workflows I talked about. And they have experienced an 11 to 1 ROI um, in using this solution. So their, their staff became one and a half times more productive and they had over 10 times return on their money to, to develop and use this system. So I don't think I really have to go into this too much for the folks in this room. Uh, in fact, the, the talk prior you know, gave a good example of you know, how, where is machine learning and predictive modeling used and how do we use it. So you know, a, lot of, a lot of us interact with, the point of this slide is a lot of us interact with predictive modeling every day. And I think everyone in this room knows that we interact with it, but a lot of people don't realize they interact with it. Um, and when you look at the data that is needed to do this and the results that are delivered, hospitals sit right there at, are at the table. It's just only recently have these technologies been applied to um, hospital and healthcare data. So here's the breakdown of, of the solutions that Zermed offers. There is a uh, a very common underlying platform here, um, driven by predictive analytics. And as I mentioned, the predictive analytics prioritize or look for these opportunities where revenue is missing um, or some cases where a claim may be denied by a payer. There's some other predictive modeling problems I'll talk about. But predictive analytics always does the prioritization, and then that prioritization is uh, is passed on to staff to do a final verification through this workflow. Um, we also have reporting on top of this, so of course you can look at metrics and, and get your up-to-date financial health uh, of a system um, with, with, with this. And then system integration is, is a good point. I'm not going to talk about it too much today, but we all know that 80 to 90 percent of this problem is getting the data pulled together correctly, getting it verified, making sure that it integrates together so that when we apply predictive analytics on top, we're not, we don't have garbage in equals garbage out. We actually are fighting patterns and trends related to revenue reimbursement. Um, so it, it, as much as I say it's important, I'm not going to talk about it too much. It's just a, it, it, as we all know, it's typically a lot of just work to clean data and get it ready to uh, get it ready for modeling. So we have this platform, and, and RCM stands for Revenue Cycle Management. So for those that are kind of new, new to RCM, Revenue Cycle is that part of healthcare that is the interface between the provider and the payer, that money exchange happening there. Um, and we take in across the bottom is, is the data sources that we get. We typically are getting claims data. We're getting data on registration. So I may have an appointment coming up. I've registered for it. There could be some pre-approval that my hospital has to do with my payer that I um, get pre-approved for certain procedures. Um, there's the payer data. Has the payer reimbursed? Um, claims or has they not? Are they denying? Are they sending messages back indicating reasons why they're denying or rejecting? Um, and then there's third-party data. You know, for a lot of our for a lot of our analytics that really involve patients, you know, we we definitely pull in um, census data and socioeconomic data. You know, that's available around the United States to uh, to help understand patient populations. And then, I won't get into it too much, but there's this integration layer where we need to pull in these disparate sources and rationalize them and make sure that they, they uh, are relevant. So when I think of a patient, um, uh, so I, I live in Chicago. I go to Northwestern Memorial Hospital for, for my health care. I go to a clinic you know, near my house for my outpatient care. 
Now, even though they're both owned by Northwestern Memorial, there are cases where it's different source systems that are holding that data. And, I'm, and, and because of their old and their mainframes, there may not be an ID that, um, that Paul Bradley and Northwestern Memorial Hospital System is the same Paul Bradley that's in their outpatient system. So a lot of this work has to happen here to even match patients. Um, but once that's done, then we apply predictive analytics, which I'll talk about in much more detail coming up. And this is where we go through and look and prioritize accounts for, for follow-up, or we, we identify areas where there's missing revenue, um, or an action can be done to improve reimbursement. So I'm going to talk to you about what we call charge integrity. And this is that case, like I mentioned, with the stent where a device or a procedure or a drug was given to me as a patient, but the code did not get on my claim to go to the, to go to the um, insurance company to pay for that. There's also what we call self-pay management. So another aspect of um, a side effect of the Affordable Care Act, is, and, and a lot of you may have uh, seen this happen, high deductible health care plans are becoming more common. Uh, um, so more financial burden is falling on the shoulders of, of the patient than ever before in this country. Um, so knowing how to manage what hospitals call that their self-pay population, and these are people who, they may not be responsible for the entire portion of their care financially, but they're responsible for a portion of it, um, is to be smart about how we deal with that population. Um, Healthcare providers typically have some options with people who owe money to them. They can either, let's say, if I may not be insured, but um, I may qualify for a Medicaid program or a federal program or a government program that I just didn't qualify for. So hospitals can be proactive to kind of look for coverage for me in that case. Um, or if they can't find coverage in me, they can write off the care to charity, which is also a benefit to them for um, um, typically relationships with local governments, and, 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 and there can be some tax implications there. Um, denial management is, is, is a big issue when it comes to healthcare providers being paid. Um, so this is, the, we, we want to manage the denials. We want to also know up front if a claim is likely to be denied, could we provide the additional information needed so that when it's submitted, it actually gets paid and reimbursed in a timely manner. Um, there are some changes coming in the healthcare space. In fact, I spent most of my morning discussing a big change which is supposed to go into effect on October, October 1st of this year, where the set of codes that are used on claims to describe what is how people are diagnosed and what procedures are done to them is done in a, a system called ICD-9. And the uh, so if, I believe I'm running this. I believe the United States is the only country in the world still using ICD-9 codes for claims. The rest of the world, as I think, is on like ICD-11 or even further. We're looking at moving next month to ICD-10, a whole new code set. And there are some estimates that denial rates are going to double when payers are requiring hospitals to code in ICD-10 and hospitals are working right now to train their staff to code in ICD-10. So there's some big changes coming down. Um, but that's just some of the applications where we apply predictive analytics. And then I mentioned the, the workflows. So the predictive analytics feed these applications, which then put these accounts that need human intervention on a work list. So a person logs in in the morning, logs into the Zermed system, and sees their list of the top 20 accounts for them to work to uh, typically uh, ranked by the likelihood that we think there's um, revenue associated with those accounts. I'm going to talk specifically about this charge integrity problem, um, which at a high level is really, there's three sub problems. I'm going to focus on the first one the most, this missing charge recovery, where a device, a drug, or a procedure was given to me and it just wasn't coded on the claim that went in. There are also things called coding variances, um, where we want to see is the, are the proper codes being put on a claim um, for reimbursement? This typically relates to uh, cases where um, if I'm an inpatient stay, so I'm staying more than one day at a hospital, a lot of, a lot of that health care in the United States is paid by a single code called the DRG. It's one code. I might have heart failure. And 
my, my insurance company is Blue Cross Blue Shield, and let's just say they pay $10,000 for a heart failure patient. So if Northwestern can treat me for $8,000, great, they get $2,000 extra dollars. If it costs them $14,000 to treat me, unfortunately, they have to eat that amount. They, they just get paid a fixed fee on a DRG. So we do a lot of analytics because if that code isn't correct, that really does uh, relate to reimbursement. So that's an example of a coding variance. Um, there are also um, things like even emergency room visits have a, little, have a level of um, associated with them. So if I come in, I've got a cut and I need stitches, that's typically like a level one ER visit. Whereas if I'm in a car accident and I come in and you know a lot of stuff has to happen, that's a level five. So those get reimbursed at, at different levels. So we would look to make sure the level of an ER visit is properly coded. And then there's overcharging detection. So the top one, I'm actually going out, I'm doing a bunch of analytics to say, this account looks odd because it's missing charges on it. We can exactly apply the same analytics and say, this account looks odd because it's got way too many charges on it, in case a lot of providers want to know that because that's, it's illegal for them to bill for care that hasn't been given to the, given to the patient. So here's, here's a little example of kind of how this charge integrity or charge recovery process evolved. It started off 20, 30 years ago where in some systems, and, and, and the anecdotal evidence had typically this happened in research hospitals where you might have had a few um, interns or, or nurses who would, who would say, you know, I think we're missing charges whenever we do this. It doesn't get captured and put on. Results in a manual audit. They pull back all of the, and they were probably pulling back a lot of paper on what was done to these patients, paper medical records, and going through and seeing is our, everything that we did to this patient, did it get on the claim? Then it went up, there was a little automation involved called billing edits. So people started to sell these systems to analyze the data that was on a claim and, and before it went out the door and make simple things like, is the social security number not all ones? Is it not all nines? Is the first name filled in? So there's some very kind of menial checks on the claim to prevent it being denied because the, the social security number is wrong or the name isn't filled in. And then there's rules software. So um, 10 years ago, a couple companies got together. They would take 300 or 400 doctors from around the country and sit them down and say, OK, if you see a patient and you do A to them, what are the other things that you would likely do to them? And and you don't have any bolts on your claim, that that's very anom anomalous. But if you saw Dr. Y and you don't have bolts in your claim, that's probably OK, because that's the way Dr. Y practices medicine. Additionally, the data also includes inherent in it the information on the demography about the patients that you are servicing. And at least as far as it comes to charge integrity and missing charges, that may not be much of an issue. But when it comes to ability of patients to pay their financial responsibility for their bill, or even denial patterns that can, that can relate to the, the patient population that's being served. So here's an example of a actual decision tree to predict whether or not a spinal cage is missing on an account. Um, so here we start off. We looked at a year's worth of data. I believe this was a, this was a client um, in the in the Dallas region long, long, long time ago, and we here we look over a year's worth of historic data, and in this case, in a year a year's worth of data, there were only 18 times where this hospital missed coding for missed the code for the spinal cage on a claim to go to a payer, those 18 accounts resulted in $215,000 that that provider had left on the table. So by identifying these, it does, the providers can, and I should have said this earlier, providers typically have a period of time after care is given, typically it's about a year, they can rebuild the insurance company for the care that they've done. So as long as we can find this within a year, they're typically the provider can go and get that $215,000. And what this is telling us as we walk through this tree is if, if, I had, if I came into the hospital knowing nothing about me except whether or not I had an epidural supply given to me 
If I've been given an epidural supply, the likelihood that having the epidural supply also occurs with a spinal cage is only 13.5%. So I'd say it's about 13.5% likely that I, if I got the epidural supply, it's about a 13.5% likely if I don't have the spinal cage that it was actually missing. But then if I look at the next condition too, so I'm anding these together. So if I've got the epidural supply and I have this um, spine injection, well, it's a little more likely that I would get the spinal cage. I'm up to 32.5% likely that I would have also gotten the spinal cage. If I did not get a carbon fiber rod, now I'm just a little bit north of 50-50 that I got this spinal cage. And then the kicker here is if I had a spinal fusion, um, a cervical spinal, fu spinal fusion without major complicating conditions, it's also 93.6% likely I got that spinal cage. So these algorithms can sift through all these data elements. I'll talk a little bit more about the data elements next to find here's just one, one path through this tree. And I think for uh, the people here, our analysts know, these trees can produce tens to hundreds of, of these paths through the tree. And here's one path that found 18 accounts resulting in $215,000. And that's for one, thing, for one thing the hospital charges for. So we score accounts like this, not only for a spinal cage, but typically hospitals bill for about, about nine to, 10, nine to 15,000 different things. So we, we have models for each one of those things that they bill for to go and score like this, to try to identify what is missing on an account. So here, here I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data preparation. Um, I'll focus here on these elements. I mean, we, we call these patient-centered data sets, and the idea is, you know, we want, to, we want to capture all of the information that describes the interaction that the provider had with the patient. Um, we include type of visit, you know, with admit and discharge dates, we compute the time that the patient is there. Typically longer, more days the patient is in the hospital means they, um, they are um, in a higher health risk, which typically means they're, a co they're costlier to, uh, to, to cure, or to make better. Um, we get the diagnosis and procedure codes. Uh, we do have historic data on charges and reimbursements. And then I mentioned physicians um, also, and what physician is treating a, a, a patient. And I'll also mention this too, in case there are physicians here. At the claim level, attributing care to a given physician is, is, can be difficult. We typically get data on, on who, the name of the attending physician during um, when care was given. Um, and that, in, in discussions with chief medical officers of the head, it, it's not always that the attending physician actually would be someone that I would ever see, but effectively this person is responsible for the care in a given part of the hospital at a certain period of time. So once we have this data set put together, integrated, um, and verified, we then are going to look at applying predictive modeling to look at the correlations between certain events that have happened with the patient and the likelihood that a charge is missing, which we gave an example of, claim will be denied, or this patient being paying their portion of a bill. And the only thing I really want, I'm not going to, I'd be more than happy after this to go into any detail of any of the algorithms and, and the mathematics, and I won't go into it now, but there, it, it, as a lot of folks here know, when you use a predictive modeling or data mining tool set, you have access to a lot of different modeling algorithms. Um, we don't, I don't know a priori which one is going to work best for a given client for a given problem. So we typically employ some, uh, some technology from the machine learning world to determine what is the best model that we can build for a given problem. Um, and, I, and I'll just go through this real quick, where we take, we take a data set, what I call the training data set, which has historic data and, 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 and also has labels. So referencing you know, the, the talk right before, this is a labeled data set. We know, we know whether um, patients have paid or not, we know whether claims have been denied. For actually the charge, the charge integrity problem of predicting missing charges, we don't, we don't, there's no way we can get correct labels there. There's no way I can go to a hospital and say, give me all of your, all of those um, instances where a patient came and you build and you build the exact right 
set of codes for that patient. The hospitals don't know if they're ever building the exact right set. The benefit here is the missing charge problem only happens one to two percent of the time. So we essentially leverage the historic data for the provider as, as truth. And then we, we hold off some of it, which I'll call a test set, randomly separate out a test set and a learning set. And, and now with this learning set, here's where we apply our algorithms. We build our decision tree models. We build neural net models. We build association rule models. Once we have those models, we apply them to the test set and get scores. And as I mentioned, the test set's labeled, so I can compare predicted labels to actual labels, compute some metrics like accuracy, false positive rates, and true positive rates, which then gives us some information into what we're going to try next. And we keep going through this cycle until we get optimized models for a given, for a given problem. Now here's something that that it, it isn't, <laughs> this isn't sh groundbreaking stuff, but we really were able to decrease our false positive rates when what we, we moved to what's called consensus predictions. And you can think about this as kind of relax, relaxing the notion of kind of ensemble modeling um, from machine learning, where here we're building different, mo different models to make predictions on missing charges. And if I look at the intersection of these predictions, um, for instance, if a decision tree and a neural network and a naive Bayes model all predict that a charge is missing, well, you think I'm probably a little more confident that that charge really is missing than if just a decision tree predicted is missing. So we build multiple models and then look at this intersection to determine what are our, where are our missing values, which as I mentioned, did really decrease our false positives. And then I do want to also mention automation. I, I hinted at this before where every, every, in fact, every day we're scoring thousands of accounts um, and trying to determine whether charges are missing. And there are thousands of charges that hospitals um, do. Or you can think about it, thousands of products that they sell. And we're trying to estimate whether an account should have a certain charge on it. So there's no, we would never be able to accomplish this unless it all ran automatically at night. Um, and so scoring, the part on the bottom, we do this daily. We get cl clients, typically our hospital system send us, they'll send us tonight all of the data on the care they gave today. And we score all those accounts for missing charges. Typically, the scoring runs in parallel in a couple minutes. Now, for model building, here's where we have to build a model for every chargeable entity. And uh, this typically, we, we do this on a typically a monthly basis. Um, we're actually tuning it for some systems uh, to only build like when, when, when we identify that the data has changed. But um, typically, model building takes hours. And we do, we, we do that less frequently. But, and it happens offline. But the scoring happens in minutes. And that's kind of part of our real-time processing of the client data. And then there's uh, dashboards and analytics. The thing I want to mention here is um, this does allow hospital administrators to drill down into areas where they see things going on. It gives them some insight into the, uh, the financial operations of their system. Um, in, in a lot of other verticals, there's been dashboard reporting for decades. Um, it's, it's, it's only happening in the last five to 10 years with hospital systems or where they're really making decisions based on data. And now, um, here's uh, one, of our, one of our examples. Um, here's a client that yeah, did see the 3% net increase in revenue. The interesting thing here, so using a, a mix, they, they use a couple, different, uh, a couple different types of our solutions. One is the charge integrity solution I mentioned. One is denials management. And then there's one that I, I, I didn't really get into called underpayment recovery. And there's not a lot of predictive modeling, or there isn't any predictive modeling that half is an underpayment recovery. But what that, what that product does is, um, let's say in my case, 
my insurance company is Blue Cross Blue Shield. So Blue Cross Blue Shield has a contract with Northwestern Memorial where I go for care. And they have all these negotiated rates and all that stuff is spelled out in the contract. So we take the information that's in the contract and we encode that into our system so that now when my, when my claim is paid by Blue Cross and Blue Shield, we can filter it through the, the contractual logic to see was it paid at the right level. So they might have paid for my missing stint, but contractually, do they, they were supposed to have paid it at 82% of what it was billed at, and they paid it at a 78%. Hospitals will almost never catch that. As long as they get some money for a line item, they are typically happy. But we're checking to make sure that the line items are being paid to the right level. And in this, in this particular case, the biggest, so this is a system that, the hospital man administration offices are on one side of the street, and on the other side of the street is the insurance company that's owned by the same parent company. And it's that insurance company that is the biggest underpayer to their hospital system across the street, and they fight like cats and dogs over it. It's amazing. But we have typically found tens of millions of dollars in underpayment. Now, most of it came from their partner across the street, but that allows them to go and, uh, and recoup that revenue. Um, and all over and all, they have this 11 to 1 ROI. So this next system is a little different. Um, this is a national system uh, across the US with over 100 hospitals. And uh, we had some really interesting results. So in the first month, because, because of this aspect of that they're able to rebuild for missing charges up to a year after the care was given, in the first month that we went live with them, they they identified as much cash that they went out and got to pay for our fees for the first year in the first month. Um, and they then after one, after uh, three and a half months, they were able to um, net bring in one, 1.3 million net. And then um, they're currently at about 2.5 million to date. And it, other than them sending us their data every day, they have four part-time people that they have working to get that 2.5 plus million um, in extra net revenue. So that's a good data point, I feel, toward these exception-based workflows. The, the staff, we're, we're able to provide the staff with the right information for them to make the quick decisions needed to get money coming in on these accounts um, without having to do a ton of extra work and digging, and that's why four part-time people are, are able to, uh, to do this, at this at the, with this client. So to wrap things up, there, the three points was providers collect a lot of their own data, as it is today, a lot of, and a lot of it just sits there. It's used to put claims together and go out. And we, but we take it and analyze it to look for these anomalies around charging, um, look for places where um, we could more uh, be smarter about how we handle our self-pay population, about how we handle denials. Um, and by dealing with data, as the main um, information source coming in, as I mentioned, we're, this naturally adjusts to changes in care delivery and the demographics of uh, the population. And with these two, with these two case studies, these are millions in net revenue. And typically, typically we see um, five to one to twelve to one ROI results with uh, with the clients with the system.